one of the things that has been incredibly disappointing to me in all this is that I have seen so many people that are rushing and actually begging government officials to take away their individual liberties and rights. Now, this is a different situation, and I understand that. And sometimes situations like this where we're in an emergency situation does mean that, you know, you, you have to take extreme measures, and sometimes the government plays an important role in that. In fact, in an emergency, that's one of the few times I think they do play an important role, but that does not mean they should get a free pass, a blank check, to do whatever they want to for a couple of reasons. First of all, when government seizes power, they tend not to give it back. I mean, all the time in government, all throughout human history, both America and other places, they erode rights during an emergency and tend to not give them back once the emergency is over. A perfect example of this is America, right now, has 31 national emergencies still in place, one of which goes back to the Carter administration. So when a emergency actually ends is uh, not something that governments are too good at defining. And they tend to hang on to those powers as long as humanly possible. Government is not good at giving power back to people. Now, America's government historically has been better than most, though not perfect. But uh, other governments tend to do the same, and it's important that we remember that and realize that defending our liberties in a time of crisis is more important than it normally is because it's when governments tend to take more power and make that the new normal. That's not a good thing. And what is really terrifying in this is the way that our religious liberties specifically, I mean, the number one liberty, when the founders came together to write our Constitution and our Bill of Rights, they said, what's the very first thing that needs protection? Religion. We need to make sure that people have the freedom of religion. There's five rights in the First Amendment, and religion was still number one. So it's not only the First Amendment, it's also the first right in the First Amendment. It's literally America's first freedom. And unfortunately, we're seeing that even curtailed in this time of crisis. Now, I want to issue a full disclaimer here so people understand. I am not saying that churches should be meeting in large groups at this time. My own congregation, the Dowry Church of Christ here in Montgomery, they went to live stream service only. I thought that was a really good idea. I praised them for doing so, and I have praised other churches that also decided that it was a wise idea to cancel services until they're, especially in this day and age where we have the digital age, I mean, it, it still would have been the right thing to do even if we didn't, even if men had to conduct their own worship services with their families and their homes, and I think that that's something that would have also been beneficial. And, and I hope that there are at least some people that are taking this opportunity to kind of step up and take more of a spiritual leadership role as husbands and as fathers in their houses right now. I think that that's actually a good thing for God's people to occasionally have to do that. Uh, but what we're looking at right now in the digital age where you can conduct a worship service with your entire congregation without anybody except for a couple of people to do the sermon and do the prayer and run the cameras... I mean, the fact that we're living in that age now where that is possible, it even more enforces the idea that that's something that we should do. So I'm in no way in favor of churches continuing to do this dangerous practice that I think is dangerous. And I, I was one of the very first people that said this, even before people were sort of caught up in the coronavirus panic that churches ought to go ahead and get ahead of the curve and do this because... It's especially dangerous when you consider churches tend to be places where young people and old people meet up in a small space where they typically wouldn't otherwise. It's one of the great things about a church family is that you have members that are older and, and younger mingling in ways that they just would not do in normal society. That's a really great positive thing that the church brings, but it's something that also makes it very dangerous at this time. And so I'm in no way saying that churches ought to meet and congregate physically inside the building, but that does not mean I think that their right to do so should be abridged. Let's go ahead and look at this graphic, and this is a tweet that came from a sheriff in the Tampa Bay area who arrested a preacher, 
And uh, there was a sound bite that went with this, but unfortunately I was not able to locate it. So uh, this is the sheriff uh, announcing, and this is reading from the tweet, announcing the arrest of Dr. Ronald Howard Brown, pastor of the River at Tampa Church, who intentionally and repeatedly disregarded state and public health orders, which put his congregation and our community in danger. So first of all, this is ridiculous on a number of levels. You can't put the community in danger without their consent if it was a voluntary gathering. Now, I agree they shouldn't have gone there. If I were a member of this congregation, I would not have shown up even if the doors were open. That's what a smart, responsible person would do at this particular time. However, that doesn't mean I think that they should be arrested for trying to do so. And putting the community in danger, the only people that would have been in danger would be the people inside the church building that voluntarily went to do so. Dumb idea, but the thing about liberty is sometimes people do stupid things. That's part of liberty is that some people are going to make decisions you don't agree with or things that are even reckless to them. It is not the government's job to be a nanny state to keep you from making what it deems as bad decisions. And this church took every single precaution that it possibly could have. Again, I think it would be better for them not to meet at all. I'll probably say that 10,000 freaking times by the time I'm done with this discussion, as I have online. I don't know, for whatever reason, people tend to not hear it. But in this church, they required every single person to use hand sanitizer upon both entry and exit, and they had the sanitizer there available at other times for anybody else that needed it. They required all people, including employees, to maintain a six-foot distance. They actually had their farmer's market area. I don't know why the church has a farmer's market. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just think it's weird. But anyway, apparently they have a farmer's market inside their church. They had it specifically sectioned off to make sure that family groups could not be within six feet of one another. Uh, all of their employees were required to wear gloves, and they had several thousand dollars spent for high-grade air purifiers to ensure that the people that were walking around, it would be far less likely for them to catch it, you know, airborne or something like that. They, they cleaned the place top to bottom. They took every conceivable precaution, and yet they were still deemed a danger to this community. This town that they're talking about, this town outside uh, or right inside the Tampa Bay area, the town had an order that has 42 paragraphs of exceptions. Not 42 exceptions, 42 paragraphs of exceptions to this order where they were telling businesses and, and whatever that they had to close down. So let's dig into this a little bit. This town ordinance said that any business is allowed to run as long as they maintain a six-foot distance between one another. But this church did that, and were still forced to shut down. And they also said that, quote, essential businesses could do so, and they have no such restriction. They, they can be butted right up next to one another. One of the commenters mentioned that at this town in Tampa Bay, their Lowe's is slam-packed. It looks like a freaking football game. And nobody's doing anything about that. That's actually far more dangerous than what this congregation was doing by any measure. Now, again, those people are volunteering to do that and volunteering not to be socially distancing one another, which is dumb, but they should be allowed to do it. But this business, for whatever reason, drew the specific ire of this sheriff, and this sheriff did this to make an example out of him. It's very clear because he announced the guy's arrest on his Twitter feed. Y you don't do that unless you're trying to make an example, trying to make a statement. This is just some punk sheriff trying to do it to scare other people into compliance. Now, another preacher named Tony Spell was also arrested in Louisiana. According to KATC, which is the local ABC affiliate there, in East Baton Rouge, uh, sorry, East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's deputies were in the church parking lot observing people entering the church. Deputies said that they were asked to be there to help prevent traffic accidents. Oh, I'm sure. They just happened to be 
in the church parking lot, they're monitoring traffic, multiple deputies in this same spot, and then they noticed people going into the church building. They were sent there to watch the church. That's legal. They, they did that to cover their butts. That's all that was. But my point is, and I, I don't know about this church. They may have taken precautions like the other one did. They may not have been. But it seems as though there is a specific animosity towards churches that don't exist for businesses because they're getting all kinds of exemptions, anything that's deemed an essential business, they're allowed to continue running, but the churches aren't. And I think that a great person that articulated this specific animosity that is carved out only for churches that are continuing to work comes from Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York City. Let's go ahead and watch that clip right here. Everyone has been instructed that if they see worship services going, uh, services going on, uh, they will go uh, to the officials of that congregation. They'll inform them they need to stop the services and disperse. If that does not happen, they will take additional action up to the point of uh, fines and potentially uh, closing the building permanently. So Mayor Bill de Blasio if you don't adhere to my order to not have worship services for the next few weeks, not only are we going to shut you down, but we're going to close your building permanently? You just don't, you're not allowed to have a church anymore? That's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. Now, being a Soviet-style communist like Bill de Blasio is, and, and I'm not saying that for emphasis he really is a communist. Like he actually fought in, in commun or I don't know if he fought, but he was involved in communist revolution. So comrade de Blasio saying that really doesn't surprise me. Communists tend to not like religion very much. Uh, but anyway, this really sets a horrifying precedent for the future, both this and the other two examples that I just gave, especially considering in de Blasio's case, it seems like he's trying to turn his own citizens into the enforcement for this thing. It's very 1984. You may remember that one of the things they did in George Orwell's dystopian novel is that the regular citizens basically became the police. It was kind of the see something, say something mentality that the citizens are going to be the ones that are monitoring society and, and uh, working for the government on that. This is kind of a similar thing where he's saying average citizens should be the ones going into churches and telling them they have to cease and desist. And if not, they're going to turn them in and we're just going to shut down your building permanently. That's ridiculous. First of all, is there any question in your mind that Bill de Blasio would never do this to a mosque? Now, granted, I, I don't think it would be right regardless of the religion, whether it's a mosque or a synagogue or a church. I don't think it'd be right to do that to any of them. But do you think there's even a 2% chance the Bill de Blasio does this to a mosque if they refuse to stop worshiping, I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and guess not. But, nonetheless, that's, that's where we stand right now. Um, I, I know that people are going to counter with, well, Caleb, it is dangerous. Yeah, it is dangerous. But here's the thing. Some people think Romans 1, teaching that is dangerous. Some people think teaching 1 Corinthians 6 is dangerous. Some people think talking about Sodom and Gomorrah is dangerous, and that's just one issue. That's just homosexuality. I mean, that's not even getting started on other things that the left would see as dangerous, like teaching, for example, that abortion is wrong. They would say that that's dangerous. People have actually made the case and, and taken people to court saying that religious organizations preaching that abortion is wrong, endangers people that are abortionists or work for abortion clinics, so on and so forth. They deem that as dangerous. If we're allowed to shut down churches whenever someone deems their actions as dangerous, well, there's going to be a whole lot of people that shut down churches because it meets their standard of dangerous, and it's going to be a precedent that Christians do not want to set. That's what I'm saying here. These things do not happen in a vacuum. It sets a, sets a legal precedent for a government to say, nope, your church is dangerous. You're teaching that homosexuality is bad. We've got to shut you down, maybe permanently. We need to send citizens into your church, and if they hear something 
that is in any way unflattering to the gay community, well, then they can report you to us and we'll make sure you get shut down. You see how this could be very easily applied, especially in the mind of someone that doesn't like religion or a religious worldview, and be used to silence churches and silence people teaching the Word of God. It's not a very long trip to get there. And this is the reason it's so important to guard our liberties at this point, because here's ultimately where this all goes down to. Here's ultimately where it all comes to a head. Unalienable means unalienable. In the Declaration of Independence, which I got hanging up on my wall right there, we have unalienable rights, rights that are given to us by God. And the government can't take them away. And if the government does try to take them away, they are acting outside of their purview, the authority that God has given to them. Even if you don't believe in God, even if you're somebody that just believes that, that rights are inherent and that's enough for us, I don't. I think they're actually God-given. But if you believe in inherent rights at all, rights that are not given to you by the government, but are given to you from a higher moral authority, then you have to believe that the government doesn't, that they're not allowed to take those rights away just because America got sick. I mean, it's a terrible thing that America got sick. And goodness knows I'm doing my part to, to try to do the best that I can to make sure that I'm not contributing to the problem. But ultimately, unalienable means it can't be taken away regardless of the circumstances. It didn't say these rights are unalienable, well, you know, except when there's a really bad crisis going on and then they can be taken away. Yet, what do you think the government's going to do if it had said that? They'd say, oh, it's, it's a really bad crisis right now, we got to take them away. You don't think that there are people with bad motivations that would use that to do evil? That's why they're unalienable. The government doesn't have the right to take them away from you. They're incapable of doing so. And when it comes to religious practices, if we set this precedent that it's okay for government to do this when they deem it dangerous, then it's no longer an inalienable right. It's no longer an inherent right, one that is given to you by God. If the government can take that right away from you now, they can take it away from you later. And that's not a precedent that I want to set. That is not something that I want to communicate to the government that you have my consent to take away people's religious liberty when you deem it necessary. And what is really disheartening about this, and what really grinds my gears about this whole thing, is that I am seeing people that I like, people that are brothers and sisters in Christ, that belong to my church, assigning evil motives to Christians that are doing this. Look, as I've said and I've said it several times throughout the course of the segment. I think that what they're doing is irresponsible. I think that it's wrong. I think that the more loving, compassionate, Christian thing to do would be to think about the health and well-being of your brothers and sisters, especially those that have risk factors, and just go ahead and shut it down to help make sure that churches aren't contributing to the problem. I think that's something that congregations ought to do. But ultimately... Ultimately, what I'm really terrified of is that I'm seeing brothers and sisters suggest that the only reason that people are doing this is because they have ill motives, whether it be because they're just worried about their contribution not being as much as it used to be, or I even heard one, and this was really bothering me, suggest that doing this was just as bad as Catholic priests abusing children sexually. Okay, I think it's a dumb idea, and I don't know how many times I have to say that, but holding a worship service at a time where the government tells you not to hold a worship service is not the same as sexually abusing a child. Come on, people. This is not that hard. And the fact that people would assign that motive and say the only reason that these people would come together to worship God as a part of the body of Christ in their congregation, the only motive they could possibly have is because they hate people and want them to die, I'm sorry, that is the furthest thing from being Christ-like. I can't think of anything less Christ-like than that. To assume that people that are coming together to worship God, I agree they're doing it in the wrong way, and I would probably have some pretty significant scriptural differences with the people that are doing so, that the only possible motive that they have is because they don't like or don't care about people. 
I'm sorry. I, I can't think of anything further away from the spirit of Christ, from the spirit of mercy and love and forgiveness, or trying to even understand somebody else than that mindset. I, I say this not wanting to, but if somebody really does think that way, you got some spir serious spiritual searching to do, my brother. You, you got to really spend some time in the scripture and on your knees and, and try to work through whatever the heck that is, because that needs to get out of your life as soon as possible. And I know that there are some people that just disagree with it and they don't think that that's the motive, but the ones that are assigning ill motives to the people without knowing whether or not that really is the motivation, that's not a good place to be, I'm sorry. And all this is going on. While we have federal judges in the state of Alabama and many other states, this is not just happening here, that are saying that abortion clinics, those are absolutely essential. And even though most of these states have put a kibosh on all elective surgeries and all elective medical procedures, they're making specific carve-outs for abortion. Our society has gotten to a point to where they say, church, not essential. Church, we can do without it. We can shut it down whenever we want to. Abortion clinics, oh, those have to stay open. We have to continue to guarantee women have the ability to kill their children, but not that they have the right to get together with a group of believers and worship. This is where we are as a society. This is why this is so dangerous. If the churches voluntarily don't hold the worship service, I'm behind that. If the elders had asked my opinion on it early on, they, they didn't. But if they had asked my opinion a few weeks ago of what we should do, I would say we need to move to live stream services. But the fact that our society has deemed it non-essential, that church is just something you don't have to worry about, we're going to put the kibosh on it right now. I don't even know what to say to that. I don't recognize my country anymore when that's where our priorities are. Where we just deem church service, worshiping God, just something we don't have to do. And that's the message that is being sent out now. The church is just a non-essential function. You don't really need it. We are putting church service on the same level as freaking football games. That's what ticks me off about this. And what really bothers me is that Christians are cheering it. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.